We are continuing our series that deals with leadership. And we've been dealing with, with the nature of leadership and, and we're, going, we're, we're beginning to, to turn a corner and start talking about challenges to leadership. And this is going to be one of those today. Exodus 33, beginning with verse 12, reading from Eugene Peterson's translation entitled The Message. The word of the Lord is as follows. Moses said to God, Look, you tell me, lead this people, but you don't let me know whom you're going to send with me. You tell me I know you well and you are special to me. If I'm so special to you, let me in on your plans. That way I will continue being special to you. Don't forget, this is your people, your responsibility. God said, my presence will go with you. I'll see the journey to the end. Moses said, if your presence doesn't take the lead here, call this trip off right now. How else will it be known that you're with me and this with me and your people? Are you traveling with us or not? How else will we know that we're special? I and your people among all other people on this planet Earth. God said to Moses, all right. Just as you say, this also I will do, for I know you well, and you are special to me. I know you by name. Moses said, please let me see your glory. God said, I will make my goodness pass right in front of you. I'll call out the name God right before you. I'll treat well whomever I want to treat well, and I'll be kind to whomever I want to be kind. God continued, but you may not see my face. No one can see me and live. God said, look, here is a place right beside me. Put yourself on this rock. When my glory passes, I'll put you in the cleft of the rock and cover you with my hand until I've passed by. Then I'll take my hand away and you'll see my back, but you won't see my face. Thus far, the word of the Lord, you may be seated. Moses said to God, look, you tell me, lead this people, but you don't let me know whom you're going to send with me. You tell me, I know you well, and you're special to me. If I'm so special to you, let me in on your plan. I want to deal with today a leader's dilemma. A leader's dilemma. We're beginning to deal with challenges in leadership, and this is one of them. One of the affirmations that, that we make as believers in God is that the God whom we serve is omniscient. That is to say that our God, the God of the Bible, is the all-knowing God. He is the God who knows everything at all times. He is the God who knows the beginning to the end and the end from the beginning, that there is no searching of this God's understanding. Our God is the God who knows all, but he's not just the God who knows all. He's the God who has all. He is the God who holds the whole world in his hand, and he is the God who is so complete in, in, in possessing everything that he says, if I had need of anything, I would not even ask you because the earth is mine and the fullness thereof. 
This God that we serve is the God who knows all things, he has all things, and this is the God who can do all things. There is nothing that this God cannot do. This is the God who created the heavens and the earth, who sustains the heavens and the earth, and he is the one who does exactly what he wants to, when he wants to, how he wants to, where he wants to. That is the God that we serve, the God who knows everything, the God who has everything, and the God who can do everything. And it is of great comfort to know that the God who invites you to follow him is the God who has everything, who knows everything, and can do everything. And therefore, this God is not blindly leading you. This God is leading you with the full knowledge about the journey that you are taking with him. This God is not making things up as you go. But this God is the one who, whose path he has already created for you. It's already been plotted. Every aspect of the journey is fully known by God. It's revealed to you in time, but it is known completely by him. The psalmist says that all of my days were known by him before any one of them began. And with this, with this, with this being so, or perhaps because this is so, there is an aspect of following God that can be quite problematic. And that is the God who knows everything and who has perfectly plotted out the course of our lives, often calls us to leadership and service without providing everything that we believe is necessary to be successful. The God who has everything, knows everything, can do everything, often calls us to lead or to follow, to, to, to serve without providing everything everything that we believe is necessary. That is to say, there are often gaps. There are pieces that we perceive to be missing. Sometimes what we perceive to be missing from God is a piece of information whose absence leaves an open question that unnerves us. Some of us are very detail oriented people, and we are visual learners, which means we don't do well when all of the blanks are not filled on the page. We, 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 we don't know. We don't, we don't have the answer to if we just knew who or if we just knew what, if we knew when, if we knew how, if we knew where, if we knew why, we'd feel better equipped for the journey, where are my visual learners who don't do well with empty blanks on the page? Yes, yes, yes. Sometimes, sometimes, sometimes God, God does not fill in the blanks. He leaves the blanks empty, and we're missing a piece of information that, that we believe is crucial if we are to follow him. But, but sometimes it's not a matter of a piece of information that is missing. There are other times when what is missing is a person or people. Knowing what we know of the journey, of the endeavor in our minds, there are certain skill sets, there are certain abilities, there are certain connections that we believe would make the journey better and easier if we if we just had this type of person or that type of person or the other type of person things would really be able to be to be done but sometimes it's not a person sometimes it's not people that are missing sometimes it's not data that is missing you can have the data you can have the person but 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 sometimes it's the material resource that is missing. 
Sometimes it's the, it's the money that is missing. We believe that we'd have a greater chance of being successful if we just had a greater level of material resources accessible to us. There are times when God will invite you to join him in what he is doing and not provide you with everything that you think you need to be successful. And that produces a dilemma, or as some people would say, a dilemma <laughs> for us. Because we like to know certain things, don't we? We like to know that we have enough to be successful before we begin a certain endeavor. And if we don't know it when we begin, we certainly want to know it shortly thereafter we've begun. We don't like gaps. We don't like blanks. We don't like missing pieces. Moses has been leading the people for some time now. And he's just experienced quite a troubling incident. In chapter 32, while Moses was up on the mountain getting the commandments from God, as God is dictating God's commandments and as God is inscribing them himself on tablets uh, down at the base of the mountain, the people were caught up in revelry around a golden calf. Moses had been up there for some time, and, and for the people, it had been longer than they liked. And because uh, the God who delivered them out of Egypt and who was leading them to the promised land was taking longer than they liked, they decided they would make their own God, and they would worship that at the bottom of the mountain. Now, Moses had left Aaron to be in charge. Aaron has been delegated the duty of holding the people together, of, of keeping things intact. And they go, and they go to Aaron, and they say, now, now, Aaron, we don't know where your brother is. He's been up there longer than we expected, and uh, here's, what we want, here's what we want you to do. We want you to fashion a God for us, an idol that we can worship on our own. Because the real God is taking too long, they now make a God for themselves. Moses is up on the mountain getting the commandments from the real God, and the people are now worshiping and un-God to satisfy their impatience. At the sight of their idolatry, God speaks of destroying them and starting all over again with Moses. But Moses intercedes on their behalf. He then returns with tablets in mind to see them worshiping the God of their hand. He smashes the tablets at his feet. He, mel he melts the golden calf. He pulverizes it into powder, puts it in water, and makes them drink it. He does so to, in part to show them the folly of trying to make a God on your own. He says, anything that you can make is also something that you can consume and that will pass from you in a few days. Meanwhile, the God who takes too long is a God who will be there when everything else is gone. He then calls for the people to choose whose side they were on. Are you going to be on the real God's side or the God of your own making? When God takes too long for you, when God does not operate according to your plan, are you going to stick with him or are you going to go and make something of your own that will fit your desired comfort and timetable? Whose side are you on? 
Where do you stand? Who's on the Lord's side? Did you know, we used to sing that song, and, and God bless him. I can still hear Michael Lloyd singing it, and then uh, with that chorus saying, get up if you're on the Lord's side. And folk would be clapping their hands and shouting. But when you understand when Moses raised this question, this wasn't a shouting question. This was a sobering question. Whose side are you on when God doesn't work? As you planned. Ah, yeah. And Moses, Moses, the writer tells us that the Levites immediately join Moses. And then Moses directs them to slay those who were worshiping the idols. And the writer tells us that over 3,000 were slain. 3,000 people gone that day. God then tells Moses, I want you to leave this mountain because I'm going to lead you into the land of promise. He says, I'm, you're going to be led by an angel who will drive out the people currently occupying the land. But then God says this, but I will not be with you in person lest I destroy you. God says, now I need for you to understand what my mercy is all about. My mercy is going to have an angel lead you because right now, if I get too close to you, I might destroy you. <laughs> what that lets us know is it is possible to actually tick God off. <laughs> it is possible to evoke the ire and wrath of God, such that God says, right now, I don't need to be but so close to you. <laughs> because you might evoke something in me that may destroy you. And so what God says is, I'm going to have an angel lead you. It's not going to be me as a pillar of cloud by day and fire by night. No, right now, in my mercy, I'm going to have the angel lead you. Because, friends, as wonderful as you may think that you are, sometimes God might not be able to stand you too much. And it is the mercy of God that keeps us from being consumed. Just look at your neighbor and say, you're not that wonderful all the time. It is the mercy of God that keeps us from being consumed. It is, it is, it is his mercy that holds back some, some stuff. And, and we will not know just how merciful God has been until we see him face to face. And until everything is shown on the screen. And God then says, now let me show you, had I not been merciful, what could have happened to you? what perhaps should have happened to you, but because of my mercy. And so God says, I'm going to send the angel to lead you. And as you travel, as Moses takes the tabernacle, puts the tabernacle outside of the camp where, where you will go, and whenever Moses would go there, then the pillar of cloud would descend. The pillar of cloud demonstrating the actual presence of God would descend at the entrance of the tabernacle and God and Moses would have conversation and it would be so powerful that when Moses left the tabernacle, he could not come out just with his face uncovered because the glory was so bright, he would have to cover his face so that the people could be able to take it. And so now we are now at the point of our text, verse 12, where on one occasion, Moses confronts God with a need for some more information. Listen to Moses. Moses says, look, God, you tell me, leave this people, but you don't let me know whom you're going to send with me. You tell me I know you well and you are special to me. If I am so special to you, let me in on your plans. That way I will continue being special to you. Don't forget, this is your people. 
and this is your responsibility. Moses said, now look, I was on the backside of the mountain. I was, I was chilling. I was fine with, with Zipporah. I was enjoying my new life. And then you called me from the midst of a bush that was burning, yet not consumed. This is your people. And this is your responsibility. And God, if I'm going to continue with your people and your responsibility, I need a little bit more information. I need to know more in order to effectively lead them. There's some gaps that need to be filled. God, you know everything. You have everything, and you can do everything. I just need you to tell me something more than what I currently know and give me more than what I currently have. Anybody ever been where Moses is? Have you ever wished that the God who knows everything and has everything and can do everything would just tell you more than what you know? Or he would give you more than what you have in order for you to be successful in what he wants you to do. What do you make of it when you're following God and and you're missing what you think is needed to be successful? Well, maybe it's this. When God calls you to leave or serve without providing everything that you believe you need, God is testing your commitment to him. Look at your neighbor and say, he's testing me. When God called Moses on the backside of the mountain from the midst of the bush that was burning but not consumed, Moses responded to God's call based upon God being the one who called him and the assurance that God would be with him. That conversation went like this. I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Surely I have seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt. I have heard their cries by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. And I am come down to deliver them out of the hands of the Egyptians and to lead them into a delightsome land, the land the land of their fathers. And then God says, I, I want you, I am sending you to go down and and tell Pharaoh to let my people go. The conversation continues, and Moses says, well, God, when I go there, when I tell them that the God of their fathers has sent me unto you, they're going to want to know what your name is. Because the Egyptian gods, they have names that that, that, that speak to the power and authority that they have. There's, there's, there, there's a God of the sun, and there's a God of the moon, and there's a God of the earth, and there's a God of the harvest, and there's a God of the waters, and there's a God of fer- fertility. And they're going to want to know, well, what is our God's name, and what is the extent of his power? And then God says, you just tell them, I am that I am has sent you. I am what I was and I will be what I am right now. I will be what I need to be whenever I need to be it, however and whenever I will cause to happen whatever I want to happen. And then God says, certainly I will be with you. And that was the extent of the conversation in in basic, in, in summary. And Moses goes with just that. God tells him one other thing. Those who you fear are dead. <laughs> Those who you fear are, are dead. And that, that is it. That's all that God tells him. And Moses moves on that assurance. Moses, Zipporah, their children, Aaron, his brother, they pack up their bags and they head to Egypt. It was just Moses, Zipporah, their little children, and Aaron. And with them was their God who declared himself to be the I am that I am. They were buoyed and they were fueled on that alone. They were tied to his cause and they bore his claims. And true to his word, God delivered them from Egyptian bondage. And God led them out with a strong hand. And now here they are sometime later and Moses feels now that there are some missing pieces. Who? is God going to sin with him? And what is God's plan now? With a reduction of 3,000 people, Moses now asked God, God, whom 
are you sending with me? With less people than what he had a time ago. Upon whom can he now count? And God is looking at Moses, who started out with nobody but God. Aaron, Zipporah, and their children. And he still has them. He still has God. And the question is, will Moses be committed to God now? Will Moses be trusting, be as trusting of God now? In other words, was Moses' commitment based on having all the facts that he feels he needs, or is it based upon the presence of God in the midst of some facts being absent? In other words, if God is the God who knows everything, has everything, and can do everything, and he calls you to follow him, then the issue is never about what you know or what you have or what you can do. The issue is, do you believe that God is enough? The issue is, can you be as trusting and as committed to God and God's desire and God's path and God's plan when there is a gap? With Moses asking whom God is going to send to be with him, look at what God says, my presence will go with you. I'll see the journey to the end. You know, sometimes you can read something, you can read something, and you can read something, and you can read something, and you really not catch what God is really trying to say. Because it just seems so plain to you. When God says, my presence will go with you, I'll see the journey to the end, you just take that to just be what it is on the surface. But when you read it in the flow, you'll see something beneath the surface. Moses' question is, God, who are you going to send to be with me and tell me what your plan is now? And God just says, my presence will go with you. I'll see you to the journey's end. And when you read it in the flow of things, not just in the flow of this immediate chapter, but in the flow of Exodus in general, you'll find out God's answer does not give Moses any new information. God does not provide Moses with any new data. God just tells him what he's already told him. He gives him a reiteration of what he's already said. In Exodus chapter 3, verse 12, God told Moses, I will be with you. And then in chapter 4, verse 12, God tells Moses, get going. I'll be right there with you. And here we are 29 chapters later, and God is telling Moses the very same thing. And with God telling Moses the very same thing, God is also sharing to Moses, you don't need any new information. It's not information that Moses has lacked. It is Moses' understanding of what was essential from the very beginning. God says, what is essential to you is not you having new data. You just need a focused faith on what I've already told you. I'm helping somebody out right now because you've been looking for God to give you some new things. And God says, no, the answer is not in me giving you anything new. It's in you having a focused faith on what I've already provided you. With, God, with Moses wondering, who is God going to send to be with him? The God who promised to be with Moses is the God who promises that he will be with Moses. He says, I'm going to be the one who's going to see you through to the end. My company, says the Lord, is the company that you need. My company is the company that has made you effective. And my company is going to be the company that will continue to make you effective. I guess I'm, what I'm trying to let somebody know is sometimes God will set you on your way without certain things that you believe you need to clarify what's really essential. 
When God calls you to be a part of what God is doing, God is saying the assurance of his presence is what is essential. Because he's the God who knows everything, who has everything, and who can do everything. He is the one who knows the end from the beginning and the beginning to the end. He is the one who has made the end, and he is leading you towards the end. And therefore, he is the one whom you really need. And when he says, I will be with you, he is saying, whatever you're lacking, he is, he has, and he can provide. All that you need is that he need to know is that this God is with you. And I wonder right now, how many times have you cried over what somebody was not, and when and, 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 and then not realize that the God who was what they weren't was still with you. How many times have you lost have you lost sleep over folk who don't have what God already has? Don't know what God already knows. Don't even want what God already wants and has planned for your life. God says what you really need is who I am. Lord have mercy. And when you zero in on who he is, you'll find that he is enough. <laughs> Having been told to offer Isaac as a burnt offering and hearing Isaac say that he saw the wood and the fire for the burnt offering. But where was the lamb for the burnt offering? Ah, Abraham said, I really can't answer it the way that I want to. So I just got to go on what I know. The Lord himself will provide a lamb and Abraham found that God was enough to provide what he really needed with their backs against the Red Sea and Pharaoh's army in hot pursuit and with Israel having neither army to fight nor having a boat to cross the Red Sea all that Moses knew was that the God who had called him is the God who was on his side and that God would fight their battle and he would, and they would hold their peace and they would stand and still and see the salvation of the Lord for the Lord will fight on their behalf and they discovered that God was enough with Jericho with, 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 with the Jordan River having its high walls and with their not having any scaffolds big enough to be able to climb and with their not having battering rams strong enough to break the walls down ah, Joshua and Israel they discovered that God was enough and I wonder is there anybody who can say I can testify for myself that when I did not have what I thought that I needed in order to be successful I found out that God was enough is there anybody here who can say I found his presence and his power and his provision to be enough for me because he was able to make the small that I had enough he was able to make the paltry in my possession enough he made he was able to make a mason jar filled with some dimes, some pennies, some nickels, and some quarters, and a few half dollars, and uh, now I'm dating myself, and a few dollar coins, and he was able to make that enough to get you in the school with stuff missing from the resume. God was enough in the HR person's mind with things being absent from your credit record. God was enough to get you the loan without the pedigree, without the legacy, without sponsors, the open doors for you. God was enough to get you in and to keep you on the other side. While you may not have had people that you thought that you needed, God was enough when you did not have the supplies or the support that others had. God was enough. And when you look back over your life, you discover that with God, you've always had what you needed. Because your need wasn't about what your need was about whom. Who you needed was God and he was whom and what you needed at the same time. I wonder is there anybody here who can say he wasn't just who I needed but he was what I needed. He wasn't just what I needed but he was who I needed. When I needed a friend he was that and when I needed resources he was that. When mama was gone and daddy was gone he was a parent and when I needed provision he was that. 
that. When I did not know how I was going to make it, God was my counselor who kept my mind, and God was the one who opened the door on the other side. When the doctor said, I see something on the film, God was my physician, and he was my healing. He was my who, and he was my what. I found out all I need was God. God tells Moses, I'm going to be with you. I'm going to be with you. I'm going to see you to the end. You see, the only one who can absolutely promise you that he's going to be with you to the end is God. Nobody else can make that promise because nobody else has their time in their own hands. Nobody else, nobody else has their time. But God says, when I tell you I'm going to be with you to the end, it's because I'm already at the end and I'm with you at the same time. And I'm not only at the end and with you, but I'm everywhere. I'm in between the spaces between you and the end. And that's why I can let some gaps occur in your mind because while you're looking at gaps, I'm the gap filler. Ah, I'll slap fire with your neighbor and say, I ain't got to worry because God is with me. He is at the end and he's in the gap in between. He is my gap filler. So he says, I'm, I'm going to be with you and I'm going to see you to the end. And then Moses says, well, God, uh, uh, I hear you, but, 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 and God, don't be, don't be upset with me. But, but if you really with me, can I, can I press this point? God. If you're really with me, and if, and if you're going to be with me to the end, God, will you show me your glory? God, 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 I hear, I hear you saying that, that you're with me, but, but, but I, need, I, need, I need to see you for real sometimes. I, 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 I need for you to show me your glory. I need for you to show me the brightness of your being. I need for you to show me, show me who you really are. I don't, I don't need you to be veiled. I need, I need for the magnificence of you to be seen. God, let me behold the wholeness of you. I can make it if I see you. I can, I can deal with what I've got to deal with if I see you. I can carry what I've got to carry if I can see you. I can bear what I've got to bear if I can see you. God, will you just show me your glory. Moses reveals, friends, that there are times when you need to see God in a special way. You need to see God beyond the norm. You need to see the manifest presence of Almighty God. And the shout is that every now and then God will let you see himself in a fresh way. He'll give you an Isaiah experience when you go into the temple. My God, you're able to see the Lord high and lifted up and the train of his robe fill the temple and every now and then he'll allow you to seem like you're hearing the very cherubim and seraphim singing to each other holy 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 is the Lord God almighty every now and then God says I'm going to let you see who I really am and so God says Moses I'm going to let you catch my glory but I need for you to understand I've got to put you in the cleft of a rock and I'm going to pass by and I'm going to speak who I am I'm going to speak my essential nature. I am the Lord. I am the eternal one. I am the gracious one. I am the loving kind one. I am the merciful one. I am the one who shows mercy to whom I will show mercy. I am the one who shows kindness to whom I'll show kindness. And I'm going to put my hand over the cliff as I'm passing by by way of my face because nobody can see my face and live. But when I pass by you and I say a word to you, then I'm going to remove my hand and I'm going to let you see my back because when I let you see my back I'm going to let you know I got your back at the same time I'm going to let you know that my weight is heavier My, I am the weighty God and when things get heavy for you I am the God who is able to help you bear the weight I am the light bearing God when things get dark I'm able to bring light into your life so that you'll say the Lord is my light and my salvation 
Of whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? I will demonstrate my glory. I'll let you know that I'm on your side. I will have you say, lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lifted up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lifted up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Is there anybody here who can say that the Lord is able to show himself strong and mighty in your life? Have there, any, have there ever been any weak times in your life and there was nobody but you and God and God came in the midnight hour, came in your prayer closet and said, let me show you who I am. I'm the God who will dry your tears. I'm a God who will lift up your head. I'm a God who will renew your strength. I'm the God who will establish your peace. I'm the God who will pick you back up. I'm the God that will set you on your way. And the good thing about this God for you and me is that this God is the God who said, I'll do something better for you than I did for Moses. I passed by Moses and I put him in the cleft of a rock and I just spoke about who I am. And when I moved my hand, I allowed Moses to see my backside. But for you in this dispensation, I've done one better. I wrapped myself up in flesh because in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning. With Him, all things were made by Him and without Him was not anything made that was made. And the Bible says, in Him was light and the light was the life of men. In Him was life and the life was the light of men. That light shined in darkness and the darkness comprehended it not. And then John goes down and says, and the word my God dwelt among us and we beheld his glory as of the only begotten of the father full of grace and truth God said I'm going to do one better for you than I did for Moses Moses never saw me my God as I really am but I'm going to let you see just who I am in Jesus he's the fullness of the Godhead bodily he's the image of the invisible God if you've seen me, Jesus says, you've seen the Father. If you want to see the very glory of God the Father, just look at Jesus. Look at him. Change water into wine and behold his glory. Look at him. Heal a nobleman's son and behold his glory. Look at Jesus. Feed 5,000 people. My God, with two fish and five loaves of bread. See his glory. Look at Jesus. Jesus, heal a man at the pool called Bethesda and see the glory. Look at Jesus, deal with a man born blind. But Jesus said, it's not because he sinned, but that the glory of God might be manifest. When he opens his eyes, the glory of God is beheld. Look at Jesus with Lazarus in the grave for four days and Jesus brings him out. That's the glory of Almighty God and then see Jesus. Really, if you want to see the arm of the Lord, if you want to see the might of God, if you want to see the strength of God, just look at Jesus on a hill far away on an old rugged cross the emblem of suffering and shame look at him hanging there wounded for our transgressions bruised for our iniquity chastened for our peace stripes for our healing Look at Jesus when the sun says I can't shine and the moon says I can't glow and the stars say I can't twinkle. Jesus in the darkness, the glory of the Lord. So a soldier says, surely this must be the son of God. He hangs his head and dies. It looks like it's all over. It's dark on Friday. It's dark on Saturday. But early Sunday morning, God raises Jesus from the dead. And so much glory was Sunday that we look back at Friday 
and say Friday is good rather than bad. When you've seen the glory of God, you can reinterpret your painful days and say what I thought was bad was really good. It was good that I'll be afflicted, that I might put my trust in him. Glory, it was good that they left me so I could know who really loves me and God could bring somebody better than who left me. It was good that I got laid off so God could supply my need and give me another job with better benefits. Glory, 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 glory. Has anybody seen his glory? I dare you to give him glory, give him honor, give him praise. Has he shown you how good he is? Give him glory, give him honor. Has he shown you how powerful he is? Give him glory, give him honor. Has he shown you how able he is? Give him glory, give him honor, give him praise. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Where are the people who've discovered that you found God to be all that you needed? All that you needed, more than enough for you. Hallelujah, hallelujah. He's been your gap filler. I said he's been your gap filler and, and only you know how big the gap was. Only you know how deep the pit was. Only you know, I mean, you know how hard the circumstance was, how difficult the situation was, but God stood in the gap for you. He was your gap filler. He's been all that you needed. And that's why when ain't nobody else there, you can say I'm wrapped up, tied up, tangled up in Jesus. He's all, he's all I need. Am I talking to anybody? Anybody at Brady's Ford Road? Any, anybody at South Charlotte? Can you say that you're wrapped up? Tangled up in Jesus, and He's all that you need. You remember when you were wrapped up by something else, tangled up in something else, but He left you empty rather than full. But you met Jesus for yourself, and now you can say, I'm wrapped up, tied up, tangled up in Jesus. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Who gone, but Jesus is still there. Money is funny, but Jesus is still there. Body is hurting, but Jesus is still there. Yeah, he's all I need. hallelujah hallelujah and sometimes God had to leave a gap so you discover that yes he is all that you need sometimes your focus was misdirected and your trust was misplaced and God said I'm gonna let it I'm gonna let it hang out there so you'll discover yes I am all that you need your loyalty your allegiance your priority was somewhere else and God said no I'm gonna let that fall so that you will know I am the one that you need and I am the one that you can he's all 